Good evening. Welcome to Newcastle After Dark. We are your hosts, the management, coming to you from the land of hot dogs and fireworks, bringing you films that are a feast for the mind. Tonight's film is 1973's Vault of Horror, taken directly from the EC comic of the same name. It has Glennis Johns, uh, Tom Baker, and Terry Thomas. Uh, Terry Thomas uh, was in Dr. Fibes, and it's a mad, 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 mad world. Mm -hmm. You'll recognize him. He's a great actor. He is. He is. Uh, This is another amicus film. Yes. And um, it doesn't have uh, quite big stars in this one, like um, Tells from the Crypt had uh, Peter Cushing in it. Joan Collins. Yeah. But this is equally as good. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The stories are interesting. Yes. As always. As always. Yeah. And it's enjoyable. So sit back, relax, and enjoy 1973's Vault of Horror. Sub-basement? I pushed ground. So did I. Well, why didn't it open?
looks like some sort of a club. Never knew there was one in the building. This elevator has no push buttons. And there's no way out. Someone's bound to come down here soon. Why not make the best of it? Good idea. Why not? Let's do that. Might as well, I suppose. Thank you. Strange situation. Almost like a dream. Dreams are much more frightening than this. At least mine are. Really? In what way? Strange. Mysterious. Unworldly. Almost unbelievable. Yeah. But so real. One feels sometimes that it's actually happening. Why don't you tell us about it? All right. I will. Found her. Where? Where? That's where she lives. I didn't like the town at all. Something strange about it. And nobody knew I hired you. Nobody saw you come here. I'm good at my job. Everything confidential. Thanks. Any time. You're a stranger in town, aren't you? Yes. It's getting dark. You better get inside somewhere. I'd like a menu, please. I'm sorry, sir, but we're closing. But it's dinner time. You can't close before 7 o'clock at night. 
It's getting dark. We always close before dark. They come out in the dark. Who? Oh. There. It's your brother, Harold. Come in. Quickly. So you found me at last? Hmm. Took me a long time. What do you want? I've come to see you. After all, you are my sister. Why have you buried yourself in a place like this? Why is everyone so afraid of the dark here? Because of them. Them? There have been 17 cases so far. Bodies found with every drop of blood drained out of them. Now, tell me why you wanted to find me so badly. Father died four weeks ago. I've been looking for you ever since. You're his heir, you know. You always were his favorite. He left you everything. For as long as you live. Good evening. 
The table d'hote is rather nice, sir. Juice, soup, roast, sweet, coffee. Sounds fine. <clears throat> Ah, tomato juice. It's rather strange. It is our usual, sir. Oh. And now, how would you like a roast clots? Well done, medium, rare. First what? Clots. Blood clots. Quite a nice bouquet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll have a glass too, please. Explain. It's with me all the time. Do you have a sister? <laughs> no. No. It's just a dream. We all have something like it. And you? What's your dream? Why not his first? My what? Dream. Vision. Phobia. Obsession. Fear. Whatever you want to call it. My dream is a very peculiar one. Very peculiar indeed. It's so real. So real. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Wilson, as they say, congratulations are in order. I'm going to get married. At your age? Well, I spent a lot of time amassing a fortune, acquiring a lovely house, filling it full of beautiful things. Now I need somebody to look after them. And me, of course. Who's the lucky girl? Oh, nobody you know. The daughter of a chum of mine, Sir George Melch. Little Eleanor? Well, she's not little now. She's grown up. Very charming, really. But why on earth should she marry you? I consider myself somewhat of a catch, really. Very easy to get on with, actually.
Elena? Elena? You've moved the furniture. Yes, I thought it would look better if I... But you've moved the furniture. I, I, I go for a magazine and it isn't there. Darling, you must admit it looks nicer. But, but, but you've moved the furniture. I'll never be able to find anything. If it bothers you that much... Well, of course... Of course it bothers me. Place for everything and everything in its place. That's how businesses are run. That's how society is run. And that is how a home should be run. Yes, Arthur. Why, my dear? Sleep well? What's this? They're mine. What are they doing in my drawer? I moved your things to your side of the bed. But my underpants have always been in the second drawer on the left, folded double with the buttons on the top. How can one live in chaos? Come with me, I want to show you something. Mm -hmm. oh, come on. There is this with me. Now, Eleanor, this is my workshop. I love making things. It relaxes me. But I couldn't make anything unless I kept all my things neatly filed away. Nails, size, length, screws, size, kind, thread, diameter. I know where everything is. I just had to put out my hand and I find it. And that, Eleanor, is the value of neatness. Yes, Arthur. Why did you marry him, Eleanor? Father had no money. I had no ability, no profession. What else was I to do? Besides, he's quite nice, really. <laughs> Except... Except for what? Well, there's... Nothing I seem to be able to do for him, except keep his house tidy. Oh. Oh, darling, darling, don't go into the kitchen. Come and sit over here. I'll do the cooking tonight. High time I illustrated to you what a splendid cook I am. And to sit down there, make yourself perfectly comfortable. I did a lot of cooking when I lived alone. Developed into a, quite a chef, actually. Oh, spaghetti and pomodoro. Tomatoes. Al dente, of course.
tomatoes, no tomato puree, no spaghetti sauce. Nothing! I must have forgotten. But there's no excuse to forget. Come over here. Come on. My dear, inside the doors of these cupboards is a list of all the items in the cupboard. Against each item are three marks. Now, every time you use one of the items, you erase one of the marks. This is the eraser, right here. So you can never have an empty space. But two marks, tomato puree, no tomato puree. Three marks, spaghetti sauce, no spaghetti sauce. You haven't even bothered. <laughs> Helena? Helena? Good morning, darling. Two doors? Last night. How splendid. How absolutely splendid. All correct. Darling. What a smashing breakfast. Absolutely marvelous. I can do with this. I've got a very hard day ahead of me. So, we're back at six as usual.
to hang a picture I came down to the nail. You've messed up my whole house. Can't you do anything neatly? Can't you? Can't you do anything neatly? Can't you do anything neatly? Can't you? Can't you do anything neatly? Can't you do anything neatly? <laughs> I couldn't be neat. But I was. I tidied up everything after I finished. <gasps> All neat and tidy. Everything in its place and a place for everything. Welcome to the first break. Well, here we are. We have five strangers who board an elevator and they end up in a room with no windows, no exit, but a beautiful table laid out with some fine liquors. Yeah, everybody's enjoying themselves. Oh, yeah, and they're discussing uh, their dreams. Their dreams, yeah. And the first story we get to is uh, Midnight Mess. Which we have a brother who's looking for his sister, who seems to have disappeared. And he finds her and goes to the little town that she lives in. And we come to find out that she's the sole inheritor of the estate. He got nothing. So he figures, you know, if she's out of the picture, he'll, he'll be wealthy. Like any good brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So. so he goes in and, you know, he takes her out. Uh, works up an appetite. Yep. So he goes to the restaurant there, yes. which I think uh, clearly says restaurant. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Right. So he goes in, and prior to that, he was in there before, and they were in a rush really to get him out. After dark, they come out. Yes. And, you know, they weren't serving no meals. Now he's back again, and it's packed, and everybody is dining, and he figures he's going to have his supper. Yes. So. And he gets some tomato soup, and it doesn't <laughs> taste quite right. He, None of the foods to his liking, no, is it? No, and he asks the waiter, you know, what, what kind of soup is this? And he tells him, blood clot stew. Nice. Mmm. Mmm. Yummy. And of course, he's appalled. Yes. Right? And now we find out that uh, this is a little den of uh, vampires, isn't yes. it? Yes. And his sister comes in, and she's a vampire. Yeah. They string him up. And, you know, they take it right from the tap. <laughs> right on his neck. Yeah. I love that. That's it, it, That was a good scene. It's good. Yes. And, you know, really, outside of that, um, it re just really isn't too, too, too gory. No, no. But, you know, that's a beautiful thing about British horror. It's always very classy, very well done, and I love the sets. Yes. You know? Yeah. And uh, speaking of class, we get to our second story, starring Terry Thomas and Glennis Johns, called A Neat Job. Mm hmm and here we have, you know, Terry Thomas, who is a wealthy bachelor, who's accumulated a lot in life, 
and decides that it's time for him to take a wife. And uh, he marries Glennis Johns, who seems to be not as uh, picky. Yeah, well, you know, seems to be he's a uh, little OCD. A little. <laughs> right? <laughs> extremely, <laughs> extremely neat. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, I, mean, yeah. I love when he's ready to play the record and make sure all the best <laughs> is off of it. So, you know. He tells her, uh, you know, what a good cook he is, yes. and you know, he's gonna cook dinner for her, and yes. educate her on fine music, and um, that's really when we start to find out that how how truly compulsive he really is. He got a sauce chart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, one day, you know, as she adjusts to living like this, she puts her drink on the table and. One thing leads to another. Right. It's a domino effect. Oh, yeah. She's wrecked the whole place. She's knocked everything over. Pictures, lemon oil on the floor. Oh, it's a right. mess. Wrecking his records. That's right. Oh, and, she, and then he comes home, and she's in the basement where all his shelving is on the floor. Hmm. And he loses his mind. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, What's he say? Can't you do anything neatly? She neatly swung that hammer. Hammer into his skull. Yeah. And what it drove me crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it was a nice job what she did with him at the end. Though. At the end, it was nice. Yeah, she um, she does make everything neat, doesn't yeah, she? Yeah, she had some odds and ends and everything in the jar. What do you think were in the odds and ends? I don't even want to know. <laughs> I don't think I even want to know. I love the teeth. Yeah. You know, and a little space between the two front that teeth. That was a nice yeah. touch. Yeah. Um, but so far, the first two stories, they're great. They're 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 very enjoyable. Yes. Yeah. So let's get back to the Vault of Horror. Are you neat and tidy? Not more than anybody else. And yet? Yet what? It's all so real. I know the feeling. I've had it often with the... What? I tell you. from all danger. Oh, 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 oh. Pray for the soul of the one within. supernatural power of human body to withstand pain through the power of mind. Whoa. 
Supernatural powers, no yoga, just tricks. Huh? As a fellow magician, I can assure you of that. to see the land of ancient mystery. Well, we've seen it. There isn't a mystery in sight. There isn't even a new trick for our act. Oh, let's give it another day or two. How much? How much do you want for a trick? Name your price. There is no trick. The magic is in the rope. Okay, then. Sell me the rope. I cannot. It was my mother's. And her mother's. And her mother's. I give you... Forty thousand rupees. It is not for sale. Not at any price. she wouldn't sell it. If I couldn't figure out how it worked, no one else would be able to. It could be a sensation. We've got to get it. Uh, 
the trick you showed me yesterday. No trick. Of course, uh, the magic you showed me. I told my wife about it. And she wondered if you couldn't show it to her. No, you know, my wife is ill, and we wondered if you couldn't come to our hotel room. I pay you 200 rupees just to show it to her. Thank you. Just a moment. Come in. This is my wife, Ines. I'm sorry you are ill. Thank you. There's no wire in it. Thank <laughs> you. 
I have before me a magic basket blessed by the gods of the temple. I open it. Akbar, I give you my blessing. May the gods protect you from all danger. There you've seen a ghost. There are no such things as ghosts, except in magicians' illusion. I have a similar vision. Do you? Similar fear. Similar, but not quite. It begins in a graveyard. In a grave. A freshly dug grave. My grave. Buried alive. How did it happen? I remember now. I remember. It's a surefire plan, Alex. Now, this will cut down my pulse and heartbeat, my entire metabolism, so that even the best doctor will think that I'm dead. Now, these are pills I'd be taking if I had a heart condition, so it'll look as though I've had an attack. There'll be no trouble getting a death certificate. Now, you must make absolutely sure that I'm buried not more than 24 hours after I die. Then all you have to do is wait until night, dig me up, and I'll hide at your place while you collect the insurance money. And we're off and away. You know, it would have made a really great story. I'd have been lucky to get 50 pounds for it. No money in horror. Once you've collected the insurance money, friend Alex, I shan't need you anymore. The perfect plan. Perfect. perfect plan except for one thing. I'll never learn it. I will never pass the anatomy course. Mm. Trouble is, we can only work in the dissection room for the short periods we're assigned to it. Mm. <laughs> if only we had a body of our own. What? Well, we could work on it when we wanted to.
Mr. Maitland. Mr. Maitland. Sorry if I gave you a fright. You got the money? After we get the body. What do you want his body for? We're ghouls. Giving out. Hurry, Alex. Hurry. <laughs> what were you throwing it, will you? Hey. Throw it that way. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Did you hear a cough? No. No. Should be just about waking up now. I wonder how long it'll take before he realizes his friend Alex isn't coming.
give me the money now. It's all yours. Sorry about the head. Welcome back. Well, here we have our second set of stories in the Vault of Horror. The first one being, this trick will kill you. Now, <laughs> this one was kind of interesting because here you have a skeptical magician. Are there any other kind? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, you know, there he is debunking the locals' magic trick. And he stumbles upon a young woman playing a horn. And this rope is coming out of a jar. Who's clearly not a native. No. <laughs> no, she's not from India. <laughs> so, But that's all right. That's all right. So he convinces her to show the trick to his ailing wife because she won't sell the rope because it's been in her family for generations. So they go to the hotel room, and of course, you know, she starts riffing on the horn, and he kills her. Picks up the horn. He's like John Coltrane. <laughs> he's tearing it up. Oh, he's, that rope's climbing out of there oh, like it's never. That rope is looking like a big cane. <laughs> <laughs> His wife jumps out of bed, as nimble as could be. In them silk pajamas. Starts climbing that rope. Right? Yeah. And gets to the top, and it screams and disappears. Mm -hmm. And there's a big blood stain on the ceiling. At that point, I think I'd be like, I'm done with this rope. That's it. You know? Which I think he was thinking, too. Well, yeah, you know what? You're right. Because he was like, man, I'm out. Yeah. And then that rope was like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're not going anywhere. Rope chokes him out. That's right. He's swinging. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you know, then they pan down to the street where the faker was, and there's our young girl. Mm -hmm. She's not dead. She's not dead. That's a heck of a trick. That is, isn't it? It was nice. Yeah. So we get to our second story, which is A Bargain in Death, which is a shorter story. Mm -hmm. It's still good. Yeah. Now, what do you uh, make of this tale? Well, I certainly think this one's a little more of a filler story. I agree. You know, um, you have a gentleman who's in who's in dire straits mm -hmm. uh, financially. Right. Obviously. Yes. Right. He's gonna fake his own death. Right. Of course, you know, he's gonna have his partner. He's gonna, he's gonna inject himself with something to right. appear as if he has died. Right. His buddy's gonna dig him up. Right. And in the meantime, you have these two medical students, and they're you know. Moaning about the fact that, boy, it'd be nice if we had a fresh corpse to mm -hmm. work on. Boy, you know, what a what a dichotomy, you know, between the two friends. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you have two creepy dudes. Yeah. And two dudes that are, like, broke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Really. And so it's the landlady that finds, uh, you know, finds him there, you know, slumped in the chair. Right? The med students come in, confirm he's dead. Yes. And... You know, he had taken a drug to give him the appearance of being dead, and mm -hmm. they bury him, and the med students are like, oh, we're there tonight. We're getting that. We're digging this up. We're getting it. Right. And uh, meanwhile, his partner is like, I got this money. I'm going to Aruba. <laughs> yeah, I'm he's out. skipping. I'm out. Yeah. So they go to the cemetery with the help of a grave digger, and they dig him up. You know, my man's alive. Pops up. That's right. And they run off. As would I. Absolutely. <laughs> they run into the road where they coincidentally cause the other partner to veer off, wreck into a tree, and die. Yeah. So they go back to the cemetery. Well, the grave diggers oh, are that's calling right. them back. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I for one... I wouldn't want nothing to do with that cemetery at that point. No. I'd be like, I think I'm going to drop medical school. I've had enough. Yeah, I think I'm going to go be a vet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a yeah. veterinarian or yeah. something, you know. And the grave digger has taken care of the problem. Yeah. With the shovel. <laughs> yeah, that's now, it. You know, do you think them guys took that body after that? I don't know. <laughs> would you have? Listen, I would have went back. 
fix myself a drink, and oh, I think that would have been, been the end of my night. Yeah, once somebody digs up a grave and you open it up and there's a, a, a live person coming out of it. Popping out of there. I might have died. I'm done. I'm telling you. Yeah, that's it. So, we have our final story. The piece de resistance. So let's get to the end of the Vault of Horror. Preposterous, Tory. It seemed so real. Almost as if you were going to do it. But why that one? Why that particular nightmare? Why are you interested in his nightmare? It's yours that you're really concerned with, isn't it? Mine begins on an island. A tropical island. The island of Haiti. Don't you remember me? Bob. Bob Dixon! Ha! <laughs> what are you doing here? I had some business in Port-au-Prince. I heard your name mentioned in a bar. How's the work going? Not bad, I think. Self-portrait. But like all my work, to be scorned, considered worthless. What do you mean, worthless? I saw one sold only a few weeks ago for 5,000 pounds. 5,000? Sold by whom? Ah, oh, the Caskell. In his gallery, he sold it on behalf of Lawrence Dilton. But why such a price? Your pictures. They've been highly praised by no less an art critic than Fenton Breedley. Fenton Breedley? Fenton? What do you wish? To buy voodoo. Why? To get revenge on those who wronged me. What do you do? I'm an artist. Who the hand you paint with? Into what? No. You want voodoo. You must do it. doll to stick pins into. You are an artist. You don't need doll. Now, go.
This will get me to London, and then you'll get it all back, and lots more. Thanks. your old studio was available. Yes. Nice to see you back. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, I bought the safe exactly as you said in your letter. And uh, here's the combination. Thank you. Uh, I bought you some milk and bread in case you wanted a cup of yes, tea. Yes, yes. Thank you. You cheated me. You cheated yourself. If you had any faith in your work, you wouldn't have listened to what Fenton said about your paintings or what Arthur said about their saleability. You wouldn't have sold them to me at the price you did. You were all in it together. That's the way of the world. You buy cheap, you sell dear. And pay a critic to tell lies so you can do it. No. You cheated me, all three of you. And I'm going to have revenge. Fenton Breedley, art critic, you saw my pictures and you lied about them to the public. Now, Mr. Art Critic, you will never see another picture again.
tell you, she doesn't mean a thing to me. How long have you been seeing her? Look, darling, it doesn't mean I don't love you. You're my wife, but we're living in the 20th century now. You'll never see another woman again. <laughs> Arthur Gaskell, art dealer. You lied to me. You told me that my pictures were worthless and that you couldn't handle them. You won't handle anything again. No, 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 that's not the way. You're doing it all wrong. Look. I don't know why we employ you. Now watch. Like that, see? Just use your intelligence. I'll show you once more. Now, Mr. Diltant, you can wait until tomorrow. Come in, and then you can go. Read about them, then. Now it's your turn. You have two minutes to live. Don't move. Just want to show you something.
your story. Well, we all have our cross to bear, haven't we? But it seems so real. Almost as if it happened. Happened? Or could. You think that our fears could be a sort of warning? A warning of what may happen? Nonsense. That's how it is, and how it always will be, night after night, we have to retell the evil things we did when we were alive, night after night, for all eternity. story is Drawn and Quartered, starring Tom Baker, who's always excellent. Looks a little like Ginger Baker. <laughs> he does in this one. Doesn't he? He does. A little bit. A little Bob Ross, a little Ginger yeah. Baker, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, he's in Haiti, and he's a struggling artist, and comes to find out that his paintings are selling for a fortune. He's been ripped off mm -hmm. by the art dealer. So... He does what any normal person in Haiti would do. He goes to the voodoo hut. Of course, that's what you do. You know, I'm mad. I'm yeah. Get some revenge. And uh, I 
I think Ginger Baker was playing them congos in that drum. <laughs> I in think that so. House. That was an old cream song. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he goes in and, you know, pays for his voodoo magic. And he sticks his hand in the cauldron. And he says, do I get a doll? And the guy says, no, you're an artist. You don't need one. Right. So he discovers that whatever he paints, the subject matter is affected. By whatever he does to it. Right. You know, he draws a, a, a painting of a vase and throws it away and the vase breaks. Right. Uh, you know, cuts a little slice of bread, races the corner, rat comes in, eats the corner. That's right. Right? So he borrows some money and goes back to London. I assume it's London. Mm -hmm. And uh, he confronts the dealer and the critic because they were all in cahoots. And uh, the gallery owner. Mm-hmm. And they say, hey, man, you know, sorry you weren't wiser, but, you know, that's the name of the game. Money, right. money baby. <laughs> right. You know, he's like, you're going to get it. So he goes back, starts painting portraits of all these guys. Pretty good ones. And so the first one, he's uh, poking his eyes out. My man was a little suave. He had that nice shirt. <laughs> he did have a nice shirt. Yeah, a nice For an shirt. older gentleman, uh, he was... Uh, he got around. <laughs> he got around, didn't he? <laughs> And his wife is none too pleased. No, no. So uh, she blinds him. She just happened to have uh, a, well, a glass she, of... That wasn't the first that's time. That's premeditated. Yeah, she yeah. knew. That wasn't the first one he run around with. <laughs> She's like, you'll never see nothing again. <laughs> so the next one, um, he has uh, his hands. Yes. And uh, we go back to the uh, gallery where they're cutting canvas. And he's like, no, 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 no. Let me show you how it's done. And oh, bah, that thing just... Come right down. Both his both hands. Both hands. Took him right? clean he's off. Like, gone. That's it. I'd be like, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I ain't working here. Yeah, I don't want that. None, none of that, no. So finally... He goes to the dealer. Mm -hmm. And the dealer's waiting for him with a pistol. And... Uh, doesn't matter. He's got the voodoo magic. Right. He draws a little red dot on his forehead, and the man shoots himself. Mm -hmm. But then he's realizing, man, this kind of stuff in here, man. I gotta get out. And he realizes he had put his painting, his self-portrait, in the safe. Right. It's running out of air. Yes. So he goes back, opens it up just in time, right. of course. Whew, he's breathing easy. He figures, you know what? I'm not gonna do this here. Right. I'm gonna put it up in one of those uh, one of those easels up there, and that's right. Let myself get some air. That's right. But he realizes that he left his watch. His yes. Minute. Yes. Yeah. So he's got to go back to right. get it to get his watch. Right. And in the meantime, there's some bumbling painter mm -hmm. above his flat, and he knocks over a can of turpentine and starts to melt, melt the portrait. Yeah. And his head is popped by a bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. That's right. Yeah. So then we cut back to the room where they're all still pondering why they have these vivid dreams. It almost seemed like they happened. Yeah. Then the elevator chimes, the door opens, and it shows a cemetery. And they all walk out there and disappear one by one, mm -hmm. except for Kurt Jurgens, who says... We are doomed to relive the evil that we did while we were alive. Mm -hmm. Night eternity. after night. For eternity. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that story. It reminds me of uh, the old Twilight Zone uh, where they were in the Old West. Yes. And a bunch of you know gunslingers yes. and such. And every night at a certain hour, you'll see them they're sitting around playing cards. Right. But when it strikes, it's their time to go yes. back out and relive. Relive their death. Their death. Yeah. Love that story. Oh, it's great. I love this movie. You know, this is a great movie. I think it's every bit as good. Yes. As Tells from the Crypt I was. I agree completely. Um, I love these British films. Oh, me too. I do. Me too. One day, we will be there. We'll go to Great I Britain. sure hope so. That would be cool. That would be cool. Well, we thank you for being here with us at Newcastle After Dark. We hope you join us again for the Lost Treasure in Cinema. And until next time, good night. <laughs>